You're listening to Paz de Chipotle, the show that will take you to discover the edible treasures of Mexico. Episode 31. Welcome to this episode of Paz de Chipotle, the audible companion of Sabor, This is Mexican Food, a digital magazine dedicated to exploring the markets, streets, recipes, and traditions that make Mexico an edible paradise. I'm your host, Rocío Carvajal, food history writer, cook, and author. To find more information about the show, please go to pazdechipotle.com. You can subscribe to the show and leave a review on iTunes, Player FM, Stitcher, Google Play, and YouTube. The evocative power of the food that we are brought up with is that when we smell, prepare, eat, or even just think about it, it preserves its epiphanic qualities, unraveling feelings, sensations, and thoughts that we have associated to it through all our lives. Food has its own narrative, and migrants know this power all too well but also anyone who is willing to explore and experience the world, countries and cultures with all the senses. The deeply emotional and evocative power of food is something we have all experienced in our lives. The smells, textures and flavors that trigger all sorts of involuntary connections. It's almost a metaphysical experience. Now, how to translate those feelings, memories, sunsets, laughter, hugs into food that, when eaten, provokes that same alchemy again? Today's episode features Lori Sandoval, the creator of Salsaology, a line of award-winning gourmet sauces that harvest the culinary magic of Lori's family heritage, rooted in the Mexican states of Jalisco and Zacatecas. Lori was born and raised in Southern California in America, and like thousands of children of Mexican immigrants, she grew up with generations of high expectations and dreams on her shoulders, the hopes to be able to build a better life and to never have to endure the sacrifices that her parents went through. She studied art history at the University of California, followed by business, then went for a master's in architecture. And it was then that, while studying in Italy, she found herself spending more and more time filling food diaries, quite like food writer Elizabeth David did all those years ago. At her return to America, Lori had a sort of revelation and realized she could no longer fight feeling drawn to food. And knowing the uproar that this will cause at home, she quietly enlisted at the Cordon Bleu. What came after was the beginning of a fascinating quest to grow into her new identity that would eventually lead her to build a hugely successful award-winning sauce brand called Saltaology. In this interview, we talk about cultural identity, the never-ending transformation of the food industry, food perceptions and cultural appropriation, and Lori's amazing cooking sauces, which are effectively bottled dreams. May Lori's solid experience, humility, talent and relentless work inspire you. I hope you enjoy this episode. Lori, bienvenida to Paz de Chipotle. This is really a delightful pairing of the name of the show with you, <laughs> that is the heart and soul behind Salsology, and it's amazing to have you here. Gracias, Rocio. It's an absolute pleasure and honor to be on Paz de Chipotle with you. Oh. You know, I've been thinking long and hard that the children of immigrants, you have a more complex life than it seems at first sight. I think it's all the more challenging when you are born 
well, into a generation that has to fight for the right of earning a place in the national economy and raise your voice and build a new nation. But I think especially Mexican-American Latinos are taking upon this very hard challenge. Now, not too long ago, you shared with me that after studying art and architecture, you were able to put, I guess, into context and also in words, the emotional connection that you felt with Mexico's architectural, natural, and also human landscapes. A connection that will resonate with you and your strong family bonds that will ultimately find an expression through your food. Laurie, uh, how could you describe the process of sharing your cultural identity that has shaped who you are and where you are now? So what can you tell us about that? Yeah, um, my story and experience of growing up as a child of immigrants is probably a little bit more unique than many others, um, mainly because I grew up in a small town 50 miles outside of Los Angeles that was predominantly Anglo um, neighborhood. I only spoke Spanish until I was about 10 years old, and this made it particularly difficult for me to um, relate to my schoolmates, to my community. This also meant that I didn't necessarily have a space to share and process my cultural identity because really there was no one like me. At the time, there were five other children um, in my class that also didn't speak English, but they didn't speak Spanish either because they were immigrants from other countries. You know, one of the first things that comes to mind in relation to cultural identity, the first idea that comes to my head is isolation. I didn't have very many friends um, because I think the language barrier and, you know, just being different, you know, automatically makes you um, an outcast, especially with children. Naturally, I sought to assimilate quickly. I learned to speak English like my community. Um, I learned to dress a certain way, act a certain way. And that was all great in my school life except at home we were very much Mexican. Um, we only spoke Spanish. Um, we watched Mexican TV programming. We only cooked and ate Mexican food. Um, more importantly, we only grew up with a very traditional set of Mexican values, home rules, basically. In a weird way, I think, well, I had to process my cultural identity in a vacuum, um, so to speak. While I was well aware of my Mexican culture at home, it did, for the most part, stay in my private home life. I don't think that I was ashamed. I just don't believe that at the time there was a safe space for me to explore what it meant to be a Mexican-American. In a way, I suppose I led a double life, which speaks to the duality that many children of immigrants experience and share on different levels. This is a, a topic that I continue to think about and explore even today, because as a Mexican American adult, it's been unique. When I went to college, I was excited and seeking these Latino or Mexican and like student groups to be able to relate to somebody and discuss these um, experiences that I thought, you know, we all shared or had in common, except that when um, I found myself in this situation, I wasn't necessarily welcomed or accepted. Um, I didn't quite fit in. I was often told that, you know, I was what they call whitewashed, not brown enough or that I didn't sound Mexican, which not only was very confusing to me and I didn't understand, but what I did understand was that it was offensive to me. You know, once again in my life, I find myself, you know, excluded from a group. And it wasn't until very much later that I was able to reconcile that all of our experiences, um, you know, being brought up as children of immigrants is going to vary greatly on different social elements, life events. And a lot of it also has to do with your own individuality. 
I eventually found and maybe even perhaps created my own space that really didn't have labels. You know, when I really, I guess, analyze it, salsaology really is an embodiment of this duality. I am taking the traditional Mexican recipes and um, ingredients of like my heritage and my ancestors of my grandparents. And then I'm able to present them to an American consumer that I understand because I'm also part of. How do you integrate that with modern cooking? I guess it's all maybe an attempt to not only showcase the complexities of genuine uh, Mexican cuisine. I, I don't know. I think maybe on a deeper level, it's also a glimpse into the representation of you know what that experience is as a Mexican American woman-owned business. I am I'm processing everything, <laughs> and I have to say that. Yeah. It's a lot to take in. Thank you for being so open about this. I guess most of the stories we hear about immigrants here in Mexico come from communities of immigrants. So you were quite right to point out that while there are pockets of big Mexican communities across America, it sort of falls under the radar, all these cases like yours that pretty much remain isolated and living this dual life like you describe very well to have this double identity of which are the family values and the cultural values you think were that much different to the rest of the community around you? You know, I, I, it's hard for me to pinpoint, you know, what was necessarily my parents' decision of being a certain way and then what is based on their cultural background. Um, but I think for the most part, parents were very, really big on work ethic for us, even as children, and having respect. Um, we had responsibilities to do at home. And I'm not saying that my schoolmate didn't have that. It was just something that, you know, was very prevalent in my home. We had curfew if we were even allowed to do certain things. So there were a lot of normal childhood activities that were normal to my schoolmates being white American, that my parents were absolutely not, you know, American, you know, gringo-like traditions or, or things that these children are allowed to do, but you are not. Um, you know, even through that mechanism, you exclude yourself. For example, I wasn't allowed to go to sleepovers, which was very common. My parents were like, Absolutely not. There wasn't that many liberty given or freedom to us, but that I think was granted to children, you know, in my class. Yeah, uh, yeah, I understand that. Sort of going back a bit on the fact that most Mexican families integrate children into families' activities. That answers for much of our Latino entrepreneurship that when we grow up and we become adults, then it becomes an asset. What, you know, many other cultures struggle to grow into this mentality of becoming entrepreneurs themselves. People from struggling economies like, say, Mexican or the rest of Latin America for us is an everyday mm -hmm. thing. I was thinking about that when I was writing the outline of this interview. I did a Google search with the terms how to build your brand thinking about how you build your own brand. I got 825 million results. It's easy as following a recipe, but it turns out uh, it's not really at all. Uh, becoming an entrepreneur, you are doing it on your own. You had to work with packaging and processing partners. You source the best ingredients. You work with probably the world's most demanding model that requires the highest standards in the food industry, that is Whole Foods. What could you share about this process, creating your cooking sauces that were the result of a process with a pop-up restaurant called Alma de Tierra? Uh, you realize, oh, people are liking these sauces, and maybe it's not my cooking in general, but this specific product is the one that can actually lead you to create your own brand and your own company and you know saying no to something you wanted but saying yes to something that was 
profitable? That's a really good question and, and a philosophical one for me about, you know, life and the journey and the path. Because as you mentioned earlier, um, I was a student of, of history, art, and architecture. And for a long time, I envisioned that, that academia was going to be my future. And when I finally dove into um, the culinary world, I just absolutely knew that I had to open up my own restaurant um, because I wanted to share certain elements elements of Mexican food. And that's really what Alma de Tierra initially was. Um, it was combining the traditional flavors of Mexico with French classical techniques and recipes that I had learned through my training and work experience. In these events, like you mentioned, these sauces were creations um, that I was putting on the menu. And people were really, you know, taken by them. Everybody would ask me um, for the recipe. And I was never somebody who would say, no, I'm not going to give you the recipe. I was happy to. It was a way of me sharing the food that I felt so proud to be um, a part of my of my culture and heritage. But um, as soon as I gave them, sometimes there was like 16, 17 ingredients and they knew how long it would take. They were like, absolutely not, but I will pay you to make it for me. So I think that initially, you know, that was a light bulb moment for me. That constant feedback might have been the seed um, that was planted um, that would eventually grow into salsaology. And so it did take me a while to let go of that dream of opening up a restaurant. I kept telling myself that I was only going to sell enough sauce to, to have enough money to open my restaurant. But you know, sometimes, you know, I, I believe that sometimes you just have to follow that path um, and see where it takes you. Because if you're constantly trying to do something, you might you might get there, you know, and if you work hard enough, I personally don't like that feeling of being against the current all the time. When the sauce production opportunities started to develop, it just felt very natural and very organic. And the more I looked into it and did my market research and realized that nobody was doing this. You know, nobody was making cooking sauces for uh, Mexican cuisine. We have it for Indian, Korean, Chinese, you know, all sorts of different ethnic cuisines, but nobody was doing anything more than green enchilada sauce, a red enchilada sauce. That was it. Or a mole. That idea really excited me to, to start a brand. There is a significant difference between um, exactly building a business and creating a brand. I look at a brand as the soul and the voice of a business. From the beginning, it was really important to me to define what we would represent as a brand. I wanted to make sure that we were highlighting traditions in the appropriate way. Also, wanted to honor all those deeply you know, rooted culinary traditions. It was a lot to put on a little brand. I believe that like if you are really careful and um, you have good intention with it, it's going to work and you're going to connect with your consumer um, mainly because you're genuine and it's real. The natural starting place for me was to showcase the, the flavors of my parents' hometowns, Jalisco and Zacatecas that it just seemed like the natural and like the right way to start the company for our award-winning ancho chile and tamarind sauce is, is inspired by the flavors of Jalisco. Um, a lot of people, especially here in the States, um, associate tamarind with East Asian cooking or Thai or Indian cooking. And they're usually surprised to know that it's a really big ingredient in Mexican cuisine. Jalisco being a big cultivator of tamarind, I know my mom and her parents and her grandparents grew up cooking plenty with, not just for paletas or sweets or agua fresca, but also, um, you know, in savory like dish applications. My mom and I actually worked on together. I took one of her recipes, you know, added my, my own twist to it. But in the end, it was something that her and I put together, you know, to honor my father's uh, hometown, a city in Zacatecas. My father also cooked. And and continues to cook is um, salsa de chile negro. This very like earthy, robust sauce that he always made from these like very hard to find chile negros. It was a big celebration that, um, and so I took this recipe and added different elements of it to to also combine it. And really, it ends up becoming more of a mole de Jamaica, like a hibiscus mole, taking all of these different elements from that area. 
and really showcasing them and again surprising the American public that you know hibiscus you know is very common and widely used in Mexican cuisine. The third one is actually a near and dear homage that I did to Oaxaca. So as you obviously may know, um, Oaxaca is very particular about their moles, specifically um, the mole negro. I mean, there's very specific chiles you have to use. I just love Oaxacan cuisine. It was a way of me trying to uh, embody the same flavor, the same um, combination of chiles that would emulate the, that uh, Oaxacan mole negro. You know, I added uh, agave nectar, some mezcal, which um, is also so native to uh, Oaxaca. And so that's actually how we created the tres chiles and mezcal. It was originally part of my menu at Alma de Tierra. And so was the Zacatecas inspired um, sauce, which was our chile negro and hibiscus uh, mole. That was also um, a part of the original um, Alma de Tierra uh, menu item. So hearing you now, I've realized that it wasn't really that much of a painful experience as I originally thought that it would be swapping one thing for another especially when it came with so many you know, personal rewards and reconnecting your own ancestral heritage in the end things sort of found its way to settling fine no no and i and i agree and i think that that's a perfect example of what i said earlier about finally finding a space that didn't necessarily have those labels that would confine me you know i knew what my life and family experiences were and are and therefore um how does that you know translate and embody in my work and my you know interpretation of these recipes so no you're absolutely right no yeah and uh of course but you are very hands on a person you kept pursuing formative experiences uh you know to put yourself out of your comfort zone and being in situations that require you to develop more skills that no textbook could give you specifically in the food industry i mean just after you graduated from uh, le golden bleu you did a series of apprenticeships at several restaurants, including one still owned by celebrity chef Wolfgang Puck, who cooks and designs menus for the Oscars. And also you stayed for a while at Riviera, one of John Settler's restaurants. Settler is the menu creator for the California Culinary Academy. And you share with me that your experience in professional kitchens taught you the ropes of what it's like to work in the food industry, which is why, of course, it makes you to this day itch at the very thought of wearing your whites again. Which were, you think, the most valuable professional lessons um, that you learned and then put in your uh, in the making of your own business and also applied in your own um, professional and personal life? You know, it's funny, you know, you brought up white, Chef White, and I just remember that I actually have not thrown mine away yet. Like, they're still sitting in my closet, and it, the being in a kitchen is very adrenaline-driven. When you asked me the question, my first gut response was really to tell you that it, you know, you really learn what a labor of love means. You know, being a, a chef or a, a line cook, um, most people would be surprised to know, is not very glamorous at all. Um, and it also will not make you financially rich. Um, <laughs> you work very long hours, weekends, you work holidays, but there is something very gratifying about nourishing um, other people with something that you created and maybe even something that you grew, you know, in your garden or in the restaurant garden with your own hands. You know, you do it because you love what you're doing. Um, but this applies to both in cooking in a restaurant, creating a dish, as well as like making a sauce. I would definitely say that, that lab you really learn what labor of love means. The other thing is also learning by being a part of a team, leading almost by example, right? You, you work alongside other people um, and you're all working towards a common goal so that everything, you know, is harmonious. That is something that I've taken and now I lead very similarly my own team. We all have something to do, including me. And, you know, I orchestrate and make sure that we all are there, that we all have each other's back and um, having the stamina to work the long hours um, that I think, you know, have prepared me to run a, a successful business. 
But the one thing that I've been able to take from being in a restaurant environment to this business um, was learning how to be tough and hold your ground and hold your own as a woman. In a male-dominated environment, um, you have to have a tough skin and you have to keep up. Similarly, in the food manufacturing business, every you know warehouse or every manufacturing plant is also um, mainly male dominated. Unfortunately, in you know both scenarios, as a woman, you are faced with you know sexism, maybe some forms of harassment. You demand respect, you know, right up front. Um, but you need to be able to have that uh, confidence to be able to speak up for yourself and stand up for yourself in these situations. I mean, I suppose we could have all sorts of readings about that. You earn respect with your talent and with your hard work and you stand your ground. Right. Yeah, that's exactly it. That definitely has to be your vision and your perspective. You definitely have to be mindful of that. Yeah. And responsible at the same time because, you exactly. know, you are paving the way to a more not only egalitarian, but also responsible society, you know, in general. Okay. Exactly. I mean, we've talked about the process and, and the inspiration behind it and how you, you force all this strength to put into into the making of your brand and your business. Uh, then comes the other part, which are your customers. Comes the first question. How on earth do you find who your customers are? Ah, you know, building from the ground up, how did you solve the problem of, you know, finding your own market, creating your brand, creating your product? What, what can you tell us about this journey? <laughs> um, okay, so I think based on these principles that you outlined, um, I pretty much failed the very first one, of knowing your customer. We all do, don't worry. Um, <laughs> I'll be completely honest. Um, I didn't know who or um, what my customer would be like when I first launched the business. The brand, the product, the flavors, um, it really was selfish, you know, and, and maybe arrogant to a, to a certain extent and maybe naive because I just thought that a small group of people had told me how delicious, you know, these things were that I just assumed that everybody was going to love them. I don't, you know, I don't really remember what my thinking was um, or why I didn't think to identify what that customer would be like. I remember the day that I did my first production. I had signed up to do this show. It was a food show here in Los Angeles. It's open to the public and people could come and buy and sample. Um, I had signed up to do this and I didn't have a product. Um, I didn't know. I wasn't even sure if I was going to get it, but I did. I got it the day before the show. I showed up with a van full of product because you have to buy in you know, big bulk amounts. I pretty much just set up my table with my my mother, my sister, my husband. Um, I was like, all right, well, let's see if this is going to work. And I I really didn't know until that moment. Luckily, um, everyone loved it. We we pretty much sold out of everything in one day. We did extraordinarily well, and then we came back the second day and did it again and again. It was it was a success. That pretty much told me that I was on the right path. What I was really surprised by finding in this process, I thought that I was really going to have the support of the Latino Mexican market. And while we do have that support. I have to say that um, our main customer is non-Latino um, consumer that, you know, doesn't necessarily know how to make, you know, 17 ingredient sauce, but they like the flavors there. That was, you know, a big surprise to me at first. The second surprise as far as the consumer was, was that the millennial group was just as um, excited about having these new and exciting flavors that were easy for them to use. And so that was another, you know, big surprising thing. But that we definitely found out, you know, later um, once we had been doing this, because I don't, I don't even know how I would have found out this information you know, um, before starting the business. That's just something that is now, you know, really in focus, but it definitely was not you know, the case in the beginning. Going back to the question of like, you know, that, how do you bring that, that idea to life? Um, you know, for us is really all about in communicating. People are really interested and really want to support genuine, real people that have this real connection with the product. And so the journey, it's been riddled with a lot of no's. It's just no after no after no. 
And I just believe that all it takes is one person to say yes. After you get that one yes, then you move on to like the next one and then you move on to the next one. That does become difficult um, personally. Um, it also costs a lot of money. <laughs> Starting a business in California, um, California is one of the most expensive states to, um, to start a business in. That I think has been probably one of the most difficult things and one of the things that has held us back from, I think, really growing even bigger than we have grown is, you know, there's a lot of capital that is needed, especially for a new um, business like, like us. But also being critical about how other cultures appropriate or incorporate specifically culinary traditions. In the recent weeks, we've been reading a series of articles that were published by the English newspaper The Guardian. Three specific authors, and I'm going to post the links on this episode's blog post. So they address the problem that what happens when you are harvesting culinary inspiration from traditional cuisines from around the world, and then you step into the danger zone of simply and black and white snatching and almost obsessively reinterpreting and oversimplifying, claiming to make better versions of what traditional dishes are. It goes from bad to worse, to plainly bastardizing and making unrecognizable creations. This just takes me to a fundamental issue about exactly in the US, who has the right to define and profit from Mexican food? Let's think about this. First, the liberal in me jumps to say anyone can profit from it. You know, Mexican gastronomy has been listed by UNESCO and is intangible heritage of mankind. But, you know, we walk into any average supermarket and face the shockingly low quality and heavily distorted products that play the world food sections. I ask myself, and I know you ask yourself to that. Where are the actual Mexican brands? Where are the food entrepreneurs? Why does everything has to be Rick Bales or El Paso or in the case of Britain, Oaxaca or Jamie Oliver's? What is going on? What went wrong? I know you have had to challenge along the whole process. You have to challenge the whole chain of the food industry one by one, educate them, persuade them to say it's worth investing in this quality product, convince your business partners to take the same risk in a country where Mexican food is seen as something cheap, disenfranchised, unappreciated, it couldn't be any further from the world acclaim tradition that it is. What happened there? What, what have you been through? <laughs> um, this is such a, an interesting, um, loaded <laughs> set of questions. But I mean, yeah, you know, I'm glad we're touching on what people are referring to as cultural appropriation. I think that this discourse is something that is important to keep having because it is a complex one filled with a lot of historical resentments, a lot of cultural resentment. You know, in some way, I think it really shows um, the themes of marginalized groups. I think that people are looking for that cultural en enrichment, as you mentioned. And one way of getting to know a culture is through food. You know, they bring back either recipes or ingredients or, you know, a package of cookies or a package of candies, you know. You know, this kind of becomes a, a, like a place where this inspiration and this a sharing of, of these cultures comes in. To me, that's just, you know, the story of food since the beginning of time, right? So many foods are so fused with many different, you know, elements. So that, you know, to me, that's not problematic. I think for, um, I take pause when um, restaurants um, of ethnic cuisines or food businesses of ethnic products, if they are owned by um, someone who is not a part of that ethnic or cultural group, and then they go on to tout it to their community or to the world as a cuisine, they act like they discovered it, you know, has come to the forefront because of them or that it needed elevating. Um, I think that's you know, usually where you get to feel the friction there. And fortunately, there are many examples, um, some of which are illustrated in, in the articles we're referring to in The Guardian. You know, on the other hand, if 
the inspiration and the application, you know, create this fusion and it's done with honor and respect to that culture, then, you know, I think that in that format, it does help to push that conversation forward. And not only does it expand our palettes, um, uh, you know, around the world, but it also expands our horizon. To your question about Mexican food um, in the U.S., um, I want to quickly um, note that, you know, one of the books I read um, many years ago is by a fellow Zacatecano um, by the name of Gustavo Arellano who wrote Taco USA How Mexican Food Conquered America. He, there, there's an outline um, of this dichotomy that exists between the relationship between Mexican food and I quote gringos. It's an interesting um, symbiotic relationship, right? Like it's through the bastardization or interpretation of uh, Mexican food that all America has become uh, obsessed with Mexican food. But again, the key word here is, you know, that it's not authentic. And so when I went out and I started selling and pitching my food product concept of Mexican food to older white men who happen to own different parts of the supply chain, I am in essence trying to change the dialogue that they have known as Mexican food over 125 years here in America. I mean, that's their reality. That's basically what I'm up against. That's a difficult thing for one woman to do. <laughs> that, that that's part of the challenge. And I think that I wish there was a formula or like a sophisticated answer um, of how I got to convince others to take a chance on this. But really, you know, it is after getting all those no's that you finally get that yes. And I believe that you get that yes through perseverance and through communication. I, I don't like to use the word education because it just sounds condescending, but it really is about communicating your perspective, your reality, your experience. And I think that that's when it really begins to resonate, you know, with the other person, you know, but even more so the most difficult thing for me has been convincing the American consumer that there is more to Mexican food than the green or red sauce, that Mexican products do in fact merit um, and hold the same high-end value as other foreign gourmet products. And again, you know, we try to have this communication, you know, through, um, through our messaging and through our branding. You know, sort of continuing exploring the use of language and how things don't quite translate culturally it is fair to make a pause, I think, and talk about the perception of your sources and how they are understood and appreciated or framed in the U.S. There's also the use of the word. So for us Mexican, the word salsa can be freshly made salsa, charred, fried, a boiled, a three-ingredient salsa, a 17-ingredient salsa. But it turns out in America, salsa has a very different connotation. Sauce, something that is more complex, that has a, probably a long cooking process, that is a key component of a dish, not just a garnishing. But until uh, you made me think about this fact, then I sort of realized what you're up against too, not only explaining your product, but even the linguistic aspect of it. You know, how has these smallest connotations have had a key role into saying sauce to describe your product and not a salsa and why have you very carefully chosen those words? Yeah, um, like you said, there is a, a significant generalization that has been done o over a hundred years in America with the word salsa and what it means. It's very common that when you are referring to salsa, you know, they're referring to what you put on your tacos or use as a chip and dip or for uh, nacho cheese or, you know, for these type of brush condiment category. I guess it was a form also of maybe appropriating the word um, of salsa because like you mentioned, it means so much to us in the Mexican Spanish culinary language. It basically just means any type of sauce. And I wanted to appropriate that correctly so that it didn't just mean the fresh condiment that it's commonly just automatically known for here. When I first started telling people, people were very confused. Um, everyone told me, well, you should have changed it to sauceology. This feedback was always an opportunity to 
respond with letting them know, like you said, informing them that salsa means soft. And over the years, it really has become almost a motto for us. In fact, I think it's one of our hashtags used, and it's salsa means sauce. Our t-shirts have it, promotional literature has it. Just three words pretty much depicts what we mean and why we named it salsaology. And they're starting to look at the cuisine as a whole differently. Slowly, you know, they're going to tell someone or they're going to recognize it, you know, the next time they see it. But it's always really exciting to see their reactions when you tell them, you know, no, salsa means sauce people from the beginning told me would be an uphill battle for me. It's something that I have taken and turned into something positive to be able to help spread that message. I guess another part of uh, making a dream come true also depends on the actual capital that you put into it. So, of course, you need to have a strong, reliable product. But, uh, I mean, let's face it, you need money. and There is no way around that. <laughs> But I really see with uh, hope and optimism how rapidly are changing, like you said, you know, all the attitudes of the rising Latino and Mexican-American communities in the U.S. I mean, I understand that the situation in certain areas like L.A. is particularly challenging. But when the financial institution, that is J.P. Morgan, assures that Latino-owned businesses, or LOPs as they call them, could add by you know, 2020, $1.4 trillion to the U.S. economy is, you know, very exciting because many people don't know, but you know, Laurie, 70% of those Latino-owned businesses are funded with personal savings for all sorts of reasons. How do you see, Laurie, the recent past and the future of Mexican-American-driven food businesses in these economic conditions and what lays ahead of your own business for the next years? Wow. Um, so I think just looking at the very recent past, so much has changed in such a short amount of time, specifically when it comes to speaking about Mexican or Latino food businesses. You know, when I first started this journey, modern um, Mexican food was not really um, a widely accepted concept or trendy as it is today. And that was only, you know, like five years ago. And now it's something that people are very excited about it but but there's also this I guess search for um, traditional authentic Mexican food that is also continuing to become ever so popular it, it speaks to the desire and the need for um, that inexplicable homey flavor that is found in humble like eateries whether here in the states or you know in Mexico itself speaking to the future you know of Mexican food businesses or Latino X will continue to see a lot of growth, there is a huge absolute appetite for these flavors. Um, the growing migrant population, I believe, will help fuel that, um, not only to just be able to feed the people you know that are from those countries, but also people that visit um, those countries and come back searching to relive those fond memories that they had while they were on vacation. As for salsaology, you know, we're going to keep sharing um, regional flavors. The goal is always for us to honor the heritage and the recipes of, of my ancestors. That kind of just is always that underlying vein. So I, I think I have room for growth. You have presence now in 60 whole food shops in, in different states, but in total, your products are sold in 300 different locations across the country. Uh, and like I said in the intro, including Hawaii. And that, to me, is pretty much the gateway to access any other international market. Uh, what about then expanding overseas? Well, I mean, I would love to um, definitely grow into other markets. But, you know, I think that that presents a lot of logistic and operation issues to work through. Um, but, yes, I would absolutely love that opportunity because that is why, you know, I decided to do this. As of recently, we actually are now being featured in Paris at a luxury department store called uh, Le Bon Marché. That was obviously a big surprise. I'm really honored 
it's our first step in the right direction. <laughs> and, you know, when I first started the business, I actually did say to myself that my goal to get, you know, go international would be to first um, be at Fortnum and Mason. Um, but, you know, I Paris is not so bad. <laughs> it's something, you know, that we're really looking forward to exploring for, for our little jars to call home. <laughs> I'm, I'm so happy that you're conquering the old world. It gives me a shared uh, sense of pride, of course. <laughs> Thank you, Rocio. <laughs> uh, I, I really, I, I cannot thank you enough for sharing uh, that much of your trajectory, your family's history. Thank you very much for that. It's, it's really inspiring for me. I hope it's really inspiring for, for everybody listening. And obviously, that inspires them to buy your wonderful salsas slash sauces now that we are on the same page <laughs> just to close uh, I would like to ask you two questions so the first one you know what has been your most significant business failure and turn it into an opportunity <laughs> well pick any month of the year I'll tell you <laughs> You know, I think as a business owner, we have a lot more failures and I think we all feel comfortable sharing um, or admitting to his failures. I think it was definitely um, going down the route of opening a restaurant, even though it never really happened to call it a failure. Having this um, idea construct of what you thought your career, your profession was going to be, being able to pivot from that realization that I wasn't going to open, you know, a restaurant or an eatery into a, you know, perhaps arguably something bigger, you know, a, a bigger platform that I'm able to share my traditions, my history, my, my heritage through the sauces. So I think that was probably the thing I can reference right now. I, I had the feeling that I knew the answer to that. Well, the second question is, uh, if you could tell the world how investing in buying high quality food products that are culturally significant will make their lives better, pitch your product, why buying it um, and help socially and culturally meaningful business uh, in general to thrive. Yeah. I, I'm so grateful for you asking this question because I think it's one that isn't asked um, often enough, especially for us um, food makers that are in the specialty slash gourmet category. What people automatically associate with that label is that it's high-end, expensive product that is only made for people that can't afford to buy you know, the product. And, and that, I have to tell you from my experience, hasn't necessarily been the case. You know, our products are in particular made sustainably, which means that we only use farmers, um, ingredient suppliers that are local to us in California. The percentage is 98%, 99% um, of all of our ingredients are local. On top of that, we're using suppliers that are natural, um, non-GMO growers. So that means that they're not using pesticides, they're not adding preservatives, we end up making and using ingredients to make these products that are genuinely good for you and your body. Um, but also, you know, we're helping support a supply chain of farmers by creating a pesticide-free environment for them to work in. So it's better work conditions for them. And then on top of that, we're helping the earth by not adding these things to it. For me, that's something that I have always stood very strongly and firmly on. You know, my margins are not as big as, you know, maybe other products are. But it's just because I really want that to be eventually the norm. And I should also mention that on top of it, we donate a portion of our proceeds to the Los Angeles Downtown Women's Center, which helps transition out of homelessness by teaching them uh, a skill or giving them job training so that they can help themselves out of homeless situations. Put all these elements to it, I hope that people can understand the impact and the greater impact that goes beyond just supporting sociology as a brand, but also, you know, how it helps the, the community, the world, and um, those that are in need. I don't think we could ask in this uh, day and age for a more rounded business model like yours to, to create something not only that gives you that, but that keeps on giving everybody else and keeps touching lives and keeps inspiring people. 
Well, and thank you for giving us the platform. This is really incredible, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity. It's my pleasure, really. <laughs> Laurie, please, just to then uh, close down, could you please tell the audience about Salsaology's social media account? Uh, if someone is interested in contacting you directly, your email, your website. And, of course, you know, there will be people listening from all over the world, but specifically all over America. So how can they buy, order, find your products and is there a way to ship overseas go on <laughs> <laughs> so all of our uh, social media handles are at salsaology s-a-l-s-a-o-l-o-g-y you will find a lot of really valuable information on either facebook um, on instagram um, we're very active to show a lot of the behind the scenes recipe ideas our website is salsaology.com if you want to shoot me an email I am L Sandoval S-A-N-D-O-B-A-L at salsaology.com if you want to see if there's a retailer near you you can go on our website there is a retail finder um, we are available on Amazon as well Amazon Prime I do know that Le Bon Marche is selling us through their website so I believe that they might be able to ship um, and I don't know if that is the strange to Paris or, or it can go into the rest of Europe. Um, I will get back to you on that. <laughs> Lock your friends in Paris. They will be able to get some salsas for now. So, Laurie, thank you very much for this interview. I'm all excited to champion your work. So thank you so much for being part of the show. Thank you, Rocio. It's been an absolute pleasure and honor. And um, I am very grateful to you for having such a beautiful platform for us and for, you know, to be able to share these flavors and things that mean so much to you and I. Thank you. We are building this story together. So, gracias y hasta luego. Hasta luego. Mexico's grand fiestas are a unique way to remember and joyously celebrate our history, cultural diversity and ancestral traditions. From the patriotic occasions like Independence Day and the anniversary of the Mexican Revolution to Christmas, Dia de la Candelaria and the world-famous Day of the Dead, these iconic celebrations bring together new and ancient traditions, from the spiritual to the joyous, always welcoming locals and strangers in rewarding and soulful celebrations of life. The Mexican Fiestas issue of Sabor, this is Mexican food magazine, explores the cultural history of the nation's festive calendar through in-depth articles and many traditional recipes to prepare unique dishes like pozole, chiles en hogada, Day of the Dead bread, and many more. To know more about the wonderful articles and recipes to start the making of your own family traditions, go to pazdechipotle.com forward slash magazine. Take sabor with you on all your digital devices. Go to pazdechipotle.com forward slash magazine and get ready to cook, learn, and enjoy Mexican food like you never imagined. Thank you for listening. This episode was written and produced by me, Rocío Carvajal. To find more information about this project, please go to pazdechipotle.com. On this episode's blog post on my website, you will find the links to the articles mentioned on the show and the links to connect with Lori and Salsaology on all social media platforms, along with a recently published article by Forbes magazine featuring Lori. Remember, you can also enjoy extra material of the episode on the YouTube version on Paz de Chipotle's channel. A great way to support the show is by leaving a review on your podcast app. This really helps connect with more listeners around the world. Alternatively, you can also help the show by making a donation via Patreon and get early releases and bonus content exclusive for donors. Patreon is the largest platform that connects independent creators with great audiences like you. Go to patreon.com 
forward slash Chipotle Podcast. Every donation makes a big difference for the show. Go to patreon.com forward slash Chipotle Podcast and be part of this delicious story. The next episode will be a rebroadcast of the Day of the Dead special and will be accompanied by a very special blog post with new material. Well, that's it for this week, my friends. Until the next time.